So again, um, extracting from the ninth chapter. Along with the word shunyata, we um, often you will find in the Mahayana the term unborn. So we are, we are going to discuss this a little bit this morning again. Mm. You know that um, the whole purpose of trying to find the truth is not just for intellectual satisfaction, but really to um, find a solution to uproot the cause of the suffering. You know, this is what I say, you know, like Prajana Paramita Siddhya Sutra. It was, for a Buddhist, it was a big summit that has happened 2,500 years ago. Just as all the summit that is happening today, with meeting with all the big political leaders, business leaders, and they claim that they are also they have these conferences and summits to find a solution to specific problems like global warming um, i don't know uh, epidemic etc just like that 2500 years ago on a place called vultures peak rajgir the conference was held. The purpose of the con conference is to really see what is the fundamental cause of all the problems. And that's the answer was Prajana Paramita. Among many other answers, one of them is the Prajana Paramita teachings. Prajana Paramita Shriya, by the way, is just a, the shortest form. In the Prajana Paramita and uh, Madhyamika, there are 20 different approach. There are actually 20 or sometimes 25 different approach to... Um, th there are 20 or 25 different ways to find the solution to uproot cause of the suffering. So, um, and the 20 different, uh, 20 or 25 different points are just just few names if I mention. Um, birth, uh, cessation, uh, uh, abiding, coming, going, mm. one, separate, one or, you know, like as, as in one, one or two, uh, you know, like uh, as um, totality or as a separate entity. So there are actually 20 different points. Some of these teachings you can find in the Buddhist canon, in the larger Buddhist canon. Out of this, considerable amount of analysis was done based on three points, which is never uh, birth, or the genesis, presentness, or the abiding, and the cessation. 
then there's a reason for that. When we define a phenomena, existence of a phenomena, it's almost always defined by where it was originated, sort of the genesis of this phenomena. Genesis of the phenomena is a quite important. For instance, like, you know, our birthday, the very, to prove that we exist, even in the passports, for instance, we have birthdays, where, and things, you know, like everything, like made in Japan, made in India, where it was made, when it was made. And then to the certain extent, expiry date is also important, the cessation. These kind of things prove existence of something. And then, of course, the abiding, the nowness, the presentness. Okay? So considerable amount of analysis is done based on these three points out of the 20 or 25 different points that I was mentioning. Out of these three, though, big amount of analysis and writings have been um, done on the first issue, the genesis, out of these three, because, one, because we, uh, we know that once this is taken care of, the rest is uh, sort of easier or they are interrelated anyway. And in not only the three points, actually the rest of the other points also. So you will... Here, along with the words like shunyata, emptiness, you will also hear words like unborn, unceasing and unborn. Now this is a little difficult to get used to, this logic. So let me tell you this way. I think it was, it is somewhere in Africa, I don't remember the actual name of the nation. I think it's Somalia. In the Somalian's mind, Solid, anything, you know, any, you know, something like this in their mind is liquid. I know you cannot accept this because you are not accustomed to that. You are not habituated that way. Anything like this, liquid in the Somalian, I think it's Somalian, I forgot the name, you know, I was trying to find out my note this morning, I couldn't. It's solid. Words means different to different people. Also, how you get trained, okay? So what I want to say is this. For ordinary people like you and me, to prove something exists, you bring the reason, well, this thing exists because it was born there, manufactured there, manufacturing date, birthday, so on and so forth, and cause and condition. It was made of this and that component. Like, you know, we are very aware of this in India, son of Shri something something, remember? Like, I don't know why that is there in the forms, son of Shri something something. Because it's very ex important for you to prove you are existing. You had a father. You understand? You actually were byproduct of a certain father. That's important. So what I'm saying is, for people like you and me, when we hear so such a so and so phenomena is caused by this and that at this place during that time, all this ends up becoming a solid proof of something's existence, right? Now, for the Shantideva's ear, this, all of this is the very proof to hear that something is never born. Just like the Somalian solid and liquid, remember? For the trained Madhyamikan ear, 
you know, this is, this is the quotation from the Buddha. Gangjik jen le jeba dema je. Dela jebi ngopo yuema yin. Something that is, something, um, okay, we are talking about the Genesis, by the way, Genesis. The first ever cause. Actually, this is also the m- main reason why all the ideas of gods and the evolution and the first ever cause and the atom and the Big Bang, I'm sure, all must have em- emerged from this. For the trained Madhyamikan ear, as long as something is dependent on cause and condition, you can impute it, you can impute and you can believe and assume that this is the birth of, birth of a table, for instance, birth of a marigold, birth of a glass, birth of a chair, whatever. You can say this, but it's only imputed. The real arising Real genesis doesn't exist. Do you like to ask some questions regarding this so that I can go further? Because if you can't, if we are stuck with this, I can't really discuss the ninth chapter. Um, at least some vague, I don't know, discussions we should have on this one. As long as, so that for the Madhyamikan, when you hear something is dependent on cause and condition, to them, it is equal to something is not born, unborn. Therefore, it is not truly abiding, and therefore, it is not truly. It cannot be. It it cannot have a cessation. So, for this reason, there is no Armageddon. There is no like the first ever cause. No evolution. No genesis. Yeah, a uh, uh, few uh, like a uh, year back or so, I had seen this uh, National Geographic film in which they were like, uh, "How to make a planet," and in that, <laughs> like, yeah, they were like uh, researching on how Earth was before life came in, mm-hmm. and trees were the uh, yes. Uh, uh, reason like why some bacteria yes. and trees came and the green color and everything then oxygen came in right. but still mm, like there existed a bacteria and, right. and like what was there before to for this consciousness to pop in right. uh, Something okay. like that. Like I have this question. Like even if we, if okay. uh, if what if everything on Earth dies, m- maybe after some uh, millions and yawns after, yes, this life will, this consciousness will come again. So yeah. Mm, okay. Maybe a little bit different this one. Uh, but uh, the my the what I'm trying to explain is this. As long as there is um, cause and condition, as long as the phenomena is interdependent, maybe that interdependent is not the right word, dependent arising. Dependent arising is basically equal to non-arising. This is why you will always hear shunyata and dependent arising together. In a trained ear, dependent arising means non-arising. For a, for a habit, for a uh, ordinary being, an arising, the act of arising, and the fact that it has a cause and condition of its arising, and the date and the place, proves its existence is true, but for, not for the Madhyamikan. For your question, uh, for your question, I can only say, uh, for the Buddhists in general, and especially Yogacarya Buddhists, would never assert, never say that there is a consciousness or a, that there is a bacteria or a, there is an atom that is independent from the co- independent from the 
mind that is conscious of. So um, this is a fundamental argument between, I think, some of the scientists and the Buddhists. And the Buddhists cannot say there is an independent object before the subject. In other words, like my existence for many of you 30 years ago, let's say, it does not exist. Now, of course, you can now imagine, well, he looks like 50-ish. So about 49 years ago, he must be, you know, like crawling on you know, all four. You know, he must be, he must have cried all of that and he can you can even throw back the present projection to the future you can think after maybe about another 10 years he will have less teeth he will have more wrinkles he will have no hairs left so on and so forth but that is present projection throwing to the past and the future yes uh, so um does this also mean that there is really no concept of causation in uh, in this view of in the Madhimika view? Because from talking from a science or physics perspective, there is uh, you look at sequence of events. Now, yes. sequence may There's not no mean causation. truly existing cause and condition. Okay, that's the only the truly the truly we can it, again let's define the truly. This is important. What is truly Rangjintani Jemin the Jana? This is the Nagarjuna's. Nagarjuna's definition of truly is, okay, there are a few elements. It has to be independent. Okay, it has to be independent. Um, it has to be unfabricated. Unfabricated, independent, and therefore permanent truly because otherwise if it is dependent and if it is fabricated and if it is impermanent we will never know which aspect of is is the truth it's now right this but the next moment it will change so we can never find out what is the real truth so the truth when we say truly the truth, it has to be inter independent. It has to be unfabricated or it should not be dependent on other cause and condition. And it, therefore, it has to be sort of somewhat permanent. Such kind of cause and condition, Buddhists will not accept. Uh -huh. Of course, we are not saying that the Madhyamikan will not agree on uh, causation and birth of a flower or birth of a whatever on a relative level all this all this is fine so uh, just one follow up question so does that mean that this view is useful only for the human condition because the view of dependent causation or if there's a sequence A, B, C, D, E, that means there is uh, um, guessing that there's a causal link. It is very useful in the world. It makes, uh, it makes trains run and so on and so forth. But it does not help our, uh, our human condition. So is this two separate domains? That in one domain, you have, um, you have the Madhamika viewpoint, which is helpful. So I'm, not, I'm looking at it in terms of helpfulness. And there's another domain in which... Uh, in which looking at uh, that there is an independent cause or there's a sequence of causes, that is helpful also. Um, I didn't really get your question. So, um, uh, so uh, let's say, um, you know, if the stone falls and I think that there is a cause for that stone falling yes. and, uh, and, and then or somebody gets hurt, then I, it's because a stone has fallen and so on. Yeah. Uh, looking at it in that way, I understand some things about maybe gravity. Okay. And that helps uh, to send an aeroplane in the sky. So there's a right. helpfulness to it. Yes. Uh, similarly, by looking that there is no, uh, no, no genesis and no cessation. No uh, true, true genesis. No true genesis. That is also helpful for the human condition. 
uh, in terms of my mind and uh, so on. So is there two, yes, these two because, separate domains in okay, which the, one the, view is good, one view is good in another place? Well, the usefulness of knowing that there is no true genesis is because there is no, uh, what do you call it? Well, we will, there is no truly existing object that you can cling on to as self and as God or as atom, so on and so forth. If you end up having that, you, your life and your perception will always be dictated by that. So, what in, in other words, you know, okay, so let's be very practical. Why Shantideva earlier is, has um, talks about all this mind training? You know, why you mind? Why are you so attached to this body? And then he's going to go on and on and then finally come to the conclusion that there is no self. And why do we have to establish this? Because we have clinging to the self. We do cherish the self. Even though, okay, we cherish the self that in fact does not even exist. This is a totally... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, misunderstanding. It is the self does not even exist. So, when we talk about egolessness, it's not as Buddhist are saying that okay, there is an ego, and then you have to get rid of it. There is no ego to get rid of. Fundamentally, there is nothing. Yet, in your habitual mind, you established an ego and thinking that there is a self. And you love yourself, cherish yourself, and that creates anger to others, jealousy, pride, all the emotion arises based on this totally ridiculous misunderstanding and a misconception of something that even does not exist and thinking that it exists. And that way, by knowing that, it's helpful. Is it uh, regarding this? Okay. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, coming back to unborn and uh, your definition that uh, that which is dependently arising is without true genesis, and we use the word unborn for that. Yes. If you are from, especially from the sublime viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So can we then say, logically, that therefore all conditioned phenomena are without true genesis, and we use the word unborn for them. Yes. So we use the word, we have now reserved the word unborn for all conditioned phenomena. Yes. Now my question is, if, I may be wrong totally, but isn't there somewhere in the Buddha's teaching where he says... There is the unborn, the unconditioned. I think mean reference to nirvana, maybe. There is the unborn, the unconditioned, the unbounded, etc., etc. Yes. Now, what is that unborn? In, in other words, is there any phenomena which is not conditioned yes, and yes. not empty? Yeah. That's the question. And how do we distinguish this unborn from that unborn? <laughs> okay. You know... Buddha does this a lot. Um, I, I, will, I will quote actually the sutra. I think it's a Samadhi Raja Sutra. I'm not so sure. You have to find this out. And Buddha said, and this is Samadhi Raja Sutra. This is again a very important sutra that supposedly teaching that does not require uh, explanation uh, but a commentary mm. it's okay uh, but i will make it very sort of kind of um i don't know i'll make it uh, very i will translate it very loosely and make it uh, colloquial so to speak so the buddha could have said hey everyone 
What is there to worry? You are all Buddha. You have nothing to do. You are all Buddha. That's what he could have said. That is the ultimate teaching. But he said in the Samadhi Raja Sutra, that kind of teaching could lead to misunderstanding. So he gave this intensive, uh, extensive example of how, you know, a doctor knowing a small baby infant for nutrition, doctor knows that he need to drink mother's milk. He knows this very well. But he knows for the time being, for because of a specific reasons, if he drinks for this next 10 days, if he drinks mother's milk, he's not going to digest this properly. So then he advises the mother to apply something very bitter on mother's um, nipple to shy away, to make the baby shy away from mother's breast. Likewise, Buddha taught emptiness to shy away from temporarily from this notion of the Buddha. So in this teaching, nothing exists. Now after 10 days, we know the baby needs nutrition. You, the baby cannot uh, hold on too long without the milk. Now what do we have to do? The mother is given advice to put sweets and lure the baby back to the breast. Like, likewise, Buddha taught all the Tathagata Garbha teachings. And these Tathagata Garbha teachings, when he taught that, then he talked about there is unborn quality. There is what unceasing, um, unchanging Buddha nature, so on and so forth. And again, just to make it more, you know, I have, you know, for the academics here, this particular teachings, there has a lot of argument between scholars whether that, this kind of teachings are expedient or not. Because there's a staunch emptiness student who would say this, this kind of teachings are teachings that requires interpretation. Because this kind of teaching sounds very similar to Hindu, some of the Hindu schools, Advaita schools, where they believe in, you know, the self. What do you call it? Um, At Atman. Yeah, and it can, it can, it can get, it can be misunderstood as that. It it is difficult, you know. You have to see it's. It's like this. You have to talk. You have to talk about the truth. The truth is emptiness and the fullness together. That is the truth. And when you study it, it's so difficult to understand the emptiness and the fullness together. So you have to sort of approach this truth from one side, either from the emptiness side or from the fullness side. In the Buddhist colleges, such as in Tibet, we, have a stra we do apply a certain strategy. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't guarantee that it works all the time. What we do is we teach eight years of emptiness, on the last year, the ninth year, the final year, we teach Tathagata Garbha. Now, also, for the practitioners, if let's say you are doing retreats, all you are interested in is practicing. You are not necessarily wanting to gather information on Buddhist philosophy. Then, your teacher might emphasize more on the fullness rather than the emptiness. But there is also the danger. This is, this is going to be an ongoing challenge. And there's a reason also. No, it's not just a philosophical reason. This is also a habitual reason. Habitually, when we dwell in the 
samsara at times we will be excited by finding something getting something we f- we become hopeful you know we become hopeful ah there is an answer to something we have a we can make plan we get di- we g- we get carried away by fullness at times in our life we get so disappointed so dis- discouraged nothing works there's no life after this there's no cause and condition karma doesn't work nothing was no plan works there's no point of living all that kind of state of mind you are ca- you are getting carried away by the emptiness aspect of your life combining the emptiness and the fullness or i i am using just the word fullness but classic buddhist term is clarity emptiness and clarity clarity combining these two is always so difficult um but that is where i would say tantric teachings are very skilled in really ex- Uh, portraying the union or the sort of the non differentiation of the clarity and emptiness and it is very difficult because it's like a dark and lightness it's like the truth and non truth because within the non truth you have to talk about the truth you cannot talk you cannot get rid of non truth and then find the truth you understand within the non truth you have to talk about the truth so and this goes all the way into the path even in the mahayana you remember yesterday i was talking about vimalakirti sutra in the vimalakirti sutra this is actually a big statement in the mahayana i'm not even talking about vajrayana here in the vimalakirti sutra buddha said lotus will be you will find lotus in the mud in the garbage you know like in the moisture in the in the in the mud in the in the you know like dirty mud muddy water you will never find lotus in a dry no mud situation likewise buddha said you will never find buddha where there is no emotion buddha is found only within the emotion therefore in the lot uh, vimalakirti sutra buddha said emotion negative emotion is nyemong panni sangje ji dungo and um, what do you call it um, cast uh, the the bo- uh, dung is means um, sort of a lineage or the um, cast Va- color color cast what if uh, varna varna right and buddha said the wisdom comes from the var- varna of emotion it is it wisdom is you will find with tender so so this is why you will find in the tantric teachings like a kilo of desire is a kilo of wisdom not less not more kilo of water is a kilo of moisture likewise kilo of anger is a kilo of wisdom um how should i put it and this is why also nagarjuna's statement like khora pangbar jubai nyangin deba chemiji when he praised the buddha i praise i praise the buddha who has never said that there is a nirvana that requires abandoning the samsara samsara does not exist truly that is the nirvana so samsara is the nirvana They, you cannot find the nirvana after abandoning the samsara there's no separate entity we are really 
talking about the shunyata, the Mahayana concept of emptiness, Mahayana concept of unborn, unarising, unceasing, unabiding, um, kind of, we are covering all of this. So I'm sorry if some of you are getting a little bit lost. Yes. And after that, Suresh, who is... Um, um, I'm a little bit confused still on the concept of um, dependent origination. If everything comes from cause and condition and there's no genesis, then how do you reverse the wheel of samsara? What is the genesis for meditation, for example? Uh, what is the genesis of meditation? You see, uh, what is genesis in your mind? I, I, when, I talk, when I say genesis, I'm talking about the first cause. Are you talking the same way? Seems- Isn't that what it means, Genesis? So yes. the so the first ever cause? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the only issue here. That's the only issue. As for, as for what was the second part of your question? Can you just rephrase it again? So I would think that um, you have no control, it seems like, from dependent origination because everything leads to another thing. So what would lead you to reject samsara? Oh, no, no. You know, actually, because of that, you have a control. Because everything is cause and condition, and because there is no original cause. That's why you have a control. Can you get that? Yeah. If you do have an original cause, this original cause will dictate you. This is why the Buddhists really hate original cause. They really don't want to hear this. Original cause means you are stuck with that. As for practicing an enlightenment, did you talk about something like that? Did you say something like that? Yeah, what is the the cause for meditation? Cause of? What is the cause for one wanting to meditate? Oh, okay. Suffering. I'm serious. But you have to know the suffering. Yes. As I said, what is the cause of wanting to meditate? It's actually the suffering. But many times we don't know the suffering. We have the suffering. I never said we don't have. But we don't know. So this is why in the Four Noble Truths, Buddha's statement is never abandon the suffering. He never said that. He said, know the suffering. Dunghal Shebarcha. He never said, you know, abandon the suffering or none of, you know, his usage of the word is important. Know the suffering. What does that mean? Because most of the time we don't know the suffering. We are, it's like small mundane things like enjoying an ice cream. We are, you know, you are looking for trouble here. Uh, you know, eating pastas. You know, we know very well we are looking for, you know, everything what we call fun, happiness is either suffering in its right or cause of suffering or in eventually it will become a suffering. And of course, the fact that we cannot control, like overeating the ice cream, whatever, that also adds up, Right? So you, uh, my answer to you is, it is the suffering. And this is what I was saying yesterday. You will always, there is a fundamental feeling, of, you know, some of us, again, this depends on the cause and condition. There are thousands of people up, out there. They have done so much. They have tried everything and still they don't give up. They think that one day, Something is going to work out. One day I can fix my life. That's That blind hope drives them. But some of us, maybe not all the way, but during this weekend, maybe once in a blue moon, we think, okay, I have tried enough. It's not really working. Something must be drastically going wrong that kind of awkwardness, that, where, why is this happening? 
generally because of suffering. Specifically, your innate wisdom is kicking, so to speak. It's making you think. Okay. Um, and just to finish the un- uh, to uh, to answer your question. Okay, longing, long, uh, wanting to meditate, dwell the pa- dwell on the path, and then finally achieve enlightenment. Okay, so how does this work in, within the context of unborn that I was talking? Like a nightmare. If you are having a nightmare, that nightmare never existed somewhere stored. Let's say you are going to have nightmare tonight. Is n- is not stored somewhere. Now, while you are having the nightmare, whatever it is, even as you dream, is not happening in reality. Right? It's a dream only. When you wake up, it's not as if the nightmare has gone somewhere, because there's nothing to go. It doesn't exist. But the absence of the nightmare is labeled as relief, liberation from the nightmare. And that's called the nirvana here in this in this call. And and that's that's why that's why the spinning of the wheel clockwise or anti clockwise still works. Um I think you make me understand uh, a lot more about the teaching of the Theravada of something arising will be passing away. So therefore, in the term of unborn, there, there is the observer mind that is continuous to observing something arising and passing away. Mm-hmm. And so something and arising and passing away now is is non-significant and mm-hmm. not non-exist. Right. But there is uh, some observer. We we have mm-hmm. some some nature Buddha, but Buddha nature or Dhammakaya or whatever to okay. observe that and is continuous, is unborn. And there is that unborn going to be born one day when when all the world is enlightened by the Bodhisattva. Is is that a, something mm-hmm. <sighs> along the line? Well, as I was, you know, I gave the example of the mother, the milk, as a means to teach, we do say there's something called Dharmakaya. You know, remember yesterday I said you are allowed to have one ignorance. Why? You don't want to suffer. And that ignorance that you are allowed to have is thinking that there is a Dharmakaya. I have to be kind of loyal to the Madhyamika here when I speak. <laughs> so I have to use much more sort of deconstructing language. Mad- Madhyamika does have that feeling of deconstructing everything. And that's the style. Now if I'm teaching uh, Uttara Tantra, let's say, Uttara Tantra, which is another text, then... Uh, then I will not be using the deconstructing language. Then I would be uh, talking about uh, you no need to do anything because doing is a mistake. Every time you do, uh, you are uh, adding, yes. yes. Not only creating karma, you are Altering, altering. Mm. And when you are altering, you are uh, diluting the truth. Mm-hmm. So you have to learn the art of not doing anything. But observing things. Not even observing at the end. But at the end, killing the observer. That was I Not told. even doing that, actually. <laughs> that's, that's what you have to, to reach learn. reach the emptiness, I think I was told to observe. Yes, of Killing course. That's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. For the path language, it's okay to encourage the students. You have to speak like that. You have, you know, 
to encourage the students to create a path to you have to create railings you have to create um, you know rest house you have to create sign posts you have to create toilets uh, you know gas stations we have a lot of that in buddhism you understand the sort of the those are very necessary so necessary without that um so this is why the zen for instance zen minimalism is very 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 valid path and that does not mean that the indian or the uh, the buddhist uh, sort of the mahayana tantric all this chaos and color and shapes and the mudras and the mantras and the songs and the chants it then minimalism does not uh, disqualify them as a path they are also equally valid so back to the nagarjuna for those who can accept shunyata zen garden is good and vajrayana tantric shrine is equally good one is not better than the other okay was who who wants to okay is it about the unborn yeah. okay i i hope it is <laughs> uh uh is the madhyamika position as far as i can figure out what by what you are saying and i m- might be wrong so please forgive me uh, is it's a sort of a position of uh, coemergence or coevolution and uh, we use that language okay and by hence uh, there is no one original cause for each of the phenomena mm. uh, but each phenomena is the cause of um, by that i mean phenomena is in its totality is the cause of each individual phenomena uh let me say this first we use the word coemergence very reluctantly and carefully because the word co indicates there's another one and we don't be very suspicious of that you understand basically you are talking about two things together and we have to be so careful with that but uh, yesterday also you said that uh, buddhism doesn't have a theory of the one no, uh, no. or did i mis- mis- misunderstand yeah no no you are right there's one is just we may use it but only as a path language great thank you so much okay Badri Thank you Rinpoche. Uh, I wanted to discuss the notion of creativity in the context of unborn. A lot of us think we are very creative and we are pursuing uh making a lot of things situations uh, objects and we have a very fine sense of uh discrimination of what is ugly what is beautiful mm-hmm. and we are constantly striving for beauty and you yourself in your work you have this amazing eye for beauty so what is the role of pursuing of beauty within the context of ultimate reality is is it is it still worth it and what is the relationship between uh the sense of discrimination the fine fine sense of discrimination and discriminating wisdom thank you Buddha is supposedly very beautiful and he is supposed to have the at least 32 major marks 
to beautify himself, his body. Actually, we are talking about. And if you go through that, they are so strange. Is there a list of? Have you ever read some some of them? It's really strange. Like antelope, like uh, ankle. And the width and the length of the Buddha's body is supposedly equal. That doesn't reflect beauty. Um, To understand the ultimate truth, all this creativity, um, beauty can be um, an aid, help, contribution. It can contribute but it can also equally interfere. When we talk about discriminating wisdom, that's quite an interesting one. Discriminating wisdom indicates that... Actually, discriminating wisdom is beautifully uh, explained by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche in one of his books as... What did he say? Uh, he, I think he termed it as chaotic order. The non-difference between order and chaos. We, the deluded beings, distinguish these two so painfully. We believe in some sort of a order and we kind of uh, develop animosity towards chaos, little do we realize that the order can only happen within the chaos. When we talk about discriminating wisdom, we are talking about shunyata. As you hear shunyata, it, there is a tendency that you may think that everything becomes chaotic. There's no order, there's no cause, no condition, no effect. Everything is chaotic. But it is the opposite. Because of the shunyata, everything functions so wonderfully. You and I can look at glass of water and enjoy this as a glass of water. And billions of the fish in this world can look at this glass of water and think that this is something else. And you and I will never have to convince the fish and say, hey, look, you guys are wrong. What we are thinking is right. We, you, you know, all this exists wonderfully. Cats can completely communicate each other with two vowels. And they don't have to go learn all the complicated... How many vowels do you have in Hindi? You don't have to go through that. And um, we, we can communicate and they can communicate. This is a manifestation of shunyata, understood as a dependent arising, in other words. Okay? Wait. There's so many questions here, so... So you can have a path that works? Yes. To your, yourself. But I would say uh, this path must take you to non-duality. Otherwise... 
it is a wrong path. But that is one my stance. You can always argue. Chandrakirti have stated saying that any path that is not leading to the non-duality will never liberate you. Because the cause of the bondage is dualism, dualistic mind. As long as you have the dualistic mind, you will always be bound. You will always have good and bad. You will therefore, you will always have uh, expectations or hope and fear. You will always have a reference. It's understandable not being able to uh, conceive the shunyata in its uh, sort of death because for us one of the biggest fear is losing the reference. Referencelessness is one of the biggest um, fear of reference, referencelessness is very, very big. This is also one of the reasons why we, are also, we have the fear of death. Because um, referencelessness. Isn't that encouraged, referenceless? What? Isn't that kind of encouraged in the practices? Reference. If you know, if you know and appreciate the referencelessness, of course, it is an encouragement. This is why uh, Shunyata is painstakingly taught here. Okay. So now again back to the. Um, Fifth chapter, somewhere in the middle. We will. If someone is giving us opinion or even criticism, one must take this as an advice and learn to become learn to be the student of everyone if someone is praising you one must acknowledge that by praising the person who is praising you if you observe someone doing virtue one should praise this person and encourage this person. One must also praise this person behind his back. If this person is praising you, you must also realize that this person knows the value of virtue. One must always try to rejoice virtue and the good quality of others. One must learn to have the bliss. One must learn to reap the bliss that is created by others, meaning that, you know, the others have done the virtue and you rejoice. So you don't even have to go through all the uh, hardship of doing the virtue, yet just by rejoicing, you also uh, not only get the immediate bliss of rejoicing, but even have the good karma of rejoicing. When you speak, speak with calmness, clarity, and um, make it... Um, articulate whatever you speak refrain from speaking that is stained by desire anger when we look at this others 
you must remember that it's because of these beings I shall attain enlightenment. With this attitude, you generate appreciation of other, the very existence of others. Because if the others do not exist, other sentient beings do not exist, you don't have the path. When you do more ha sort of higher virtuous acts such as samadhi, like meditation, you can relax with a more uh, gross or um, lower virtuous action such as generosity. I in all times, no matter what you do, Benefiting the others should be the primary concern. One's diligence should be dedicated to the act that benefits others and only that act. If it is benefiting others, Buddha have even given us, given the Bodhisattva, um, the allowance to act that are usually prohibited. If, uh, again, this is a specific advice to the monks, if you have attained offerings that are more than what you can use, share it with those who are protectorless, those who are wanderer, beggars, Eat um, moderately. If you have more than three pieces of dharma robes, give the rest. Do not harm your body for small, um, trivial purpose purposes. If you act according to these instructions, you, your wish to liberate all sentient beings will be fulfilled swiftly. Until you are perfected with the compassion, meaning uh, until you have achieved the first Bhumi Bodhisattva, it is advised not to give up this body. Do not teach to those who are not respectful to the teaching. Do not teach to those who are wearing turban. <laughs> those who are also holding umbrellas, spears or weapons. Or those, who, those whose head is covered. These are also you have to remember the ancient Indian etiquette that are still found in these texts. Do not teach to those who are not ready all the... Do not teach the profound teachings to those who are not ready. And the monks do not teach Ladies, without the presence of another man. Again, if you encounter a student who can actually Appreciate the profound and the vast teaching. Do not sidetrack them by insisting on preliminary teachings. Do not waste their time by giving, uh, overloading them with all kinds of ethical and moralistic teachings. Do not deceive them with 
teachings such as dharanis or the mantras. If you, if you have used the used tooth, uh, toothbrush, I think, I think it's the one that Indians sometimes use, toothbrush and saliva. Uh, after after throwing it, must be covered by earth. Same with um, like urinating in the water, uh, like a river, and um, Uh, gr- um, field that are commonly used when you eat don't stuff your um, food uh, don't overstuff your uh, mouth with food don't eat with loud noise don't open too um, much um, don't open your mouth too much. Don't um, sit stretching your legs. Do not wash your hand um, together. Now this is this is always so interesting for me. You know, like wh- why you have to go through all that. But again, remember, this is all. Uh, if you you know one could think you know as I did like why why not wash like this why do I have to wash first this and the second this you know, you're not supposed to wash like that this is a vipassana training this is a confinement training basically if you can appreciate when you are told to meditate if you can appreciate instructions like okay let's meditate let's sit straight. Sitting straight, the instruction of sitting straight is as arbitrary as this. Actually, it it's well, sitting straight. Why why sit straight? Why not just lie down and meditate? Why not walk around and meditate? Why not dance and meditate? But for the beginners, you see, in the in the, in the higher teachings, you can dance, you can eat, you can. Do whatever you, you can even sleep and meditate. But here we are talking about the beginner uh, bodhisattvas. For them, this kind of a gradual confinement becomes like a reminder, like a, like a, s- a source of mindfulness. So this is why, but I know many of these are also um, based on a certain period um, culturally um, different. Maybe some of us could think it's a little bit irrelevant and maybe it is true. But the gist of this, the essence of this is um, mindfulness in action, basically vipassana in action. Um, monks should not be sitting um, uh, with a woman unaccompanied by uh, another monk. Uh, ask what is considered unrespectful when you travel in different places and avoid doing that. One should not indicate or show the path with finger, with all the uh, with the right hand, um, with a complete hand, one must show the path. One should not move the hand violently. Um, use um, gently snapping fingers to indicate. When you indicate whatever you need to indicate, 
when you sleep like the tathagata how he slept follow that manner again and again pay attention to mind training again and again preferably three times um in the day and the night the bodhisattva should read the three hip sutra again and again the bodhisattva must refer to uh what a bodhisattva can do and cannot <laughs> 